Hi, I'm Jay Allen Sanford from the San Diego Reader. And we're here to talk about this 1950s television anthology, Tales of Tomorrow. I've written about shows like this uh, for magazines like Cult Movies, Starlog, Film Facts, and Midnight Marquee. Uh, the San Diego Reader actually published my in-depth history of this program a while back. Uh, that article was started back in 1989, and uh, I interviewed several of the show creators and performers, and I'll be quoting from several of those interviews over the course of these DVD commentaries. And in fact, you'll be able to, uh, on this episode, toggle over on your audio switch and actually hear more Abrahams himself, who's one of the creators of the program. Well, since this is the debut episode, and most of you, I assume, are playing these episodes in order, uh, I'll go ahead and give you a brief nutshell summary of how this program ended up being broadcast, uh, and this episode being broadcast on August 3rd, 1951. The show was originally planned to be called Tomorrow is Yours, and the idea for it can be traced back to science fiction author Theodore Sturgeon, who provided the story, in fact, for this first episode. And TV producer Mort Abrahams partnered up with him. Uh, Abrahams would go on to work on shows like Route 66, The Man from Uncle, uh, and, and some films you're probably familiar with, like Dr. Doolittle, Goodbye Mr. Chips, and the one he's probably best known for, the first two Planet of the Apes films, the two, rather, he's best known for. Uh, at the time, when this uh, aired in the early 50s, he was fairly known for writing uh, science fiction, writing for magazines like Weird Tales, Planet Stories, and uh, it really wouldn't be until later that he'd be widely known by the general audience, uh, probably on the strength of things like scripting classic Star Trek episodes like Shore Leave in 1966 and A Muck Time uh, the following year, I think in 67. Um, and if you watch the 1980s reboot of The Twilight Zone, which I assume a lot of folks watching this DVD uh, would be likely to do, uh, he wrote for that and uh, even wrote for the Land of the Lost TV series. Uh, and, and I think there was an episode of The Invaders based on one of his stories. So Abrahams and Sturgeon, they put together what they called the Science Fiction League of America. And what this was, was a coalition of 12 science fiction writers who provided the TV rights to all their published short stories. Uh, Abrahams would pay a weekly per show royalty to the League, and then he gave an individual payment to the author of, the, uh, of that particular week's episode, who, who was adapted for that show. Uh, this was an incredible pool of material that, according to Abrahams, numbered around 3,000 stories. So the original title, Tomorrow is Yours, was replaced with Tales of Tomorrow, and uh, the writers who were part of that Science Fiction League of America included Arthur C. Clarke, whose story All the Time in the World was adapted, C.M. Kornbluth, uh, whose story Little Black Bag was on the show, Stanley G. Weinbaum, <coughs> who contributed The Miraculous Serum, Frederick, uh, Frederick Brown, uh, two episodes actually were based on his works, Age of Peril and The Last Man on Earth, and there are also some of the uh, you know, classic public domain stories by authors like H.G. Wells, Jules Verne. Uh, they did The Crystal Egg by H.G. Wells. They did a two-parter of the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea H. by Jules Verne. Uh, there was an Oscar Wilde adaptation. They did The Picture of Dorian Gray. Uh, and probably the one that is most famous from the series, they adapted Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, playing the monster in that one. We have uh, several other commentaries on that one when we get to it. So aside from the show co-creator uh, Theodore Sturgeon, there were several other writers in the Science Fiction League like Robert Heinlein, uh, Frederick Pohl, Philip Wiley, Her Henry Kuttner, uh, John Campbell, Ray Bradbury, of course, was in there, uh, and A.E. Van Vo. I think that covers all of them. Uh, so once the show hired a producer and they found sponsors, all of whom we'll talk about in some of the other commentaries, Tales of Tomorrow was running pretty much year-round on ABC from August 1951 through June 1953. It was two seasons and there was a total of 85 half-hour episodes. They shot them at ABC's Studio One, which was in New York City. They usually start rehearsals on Monday and then perform it live for the cameras on Friday at 9.30. And at the same time as it was broadcast, producers would shoot a kinescope for all the unhooked up stations, the ones that played it at uh, different times. The kinescope process, of course, being uh, basically you point a, a camera, an Eastman recording camera at a TV as the show airs and you film it. And it's on the strength of, uh, of them having done that that we get to see these episodes now. Um, so, so Tales of Tomorrow, though, you know, you probably have heard it called 
TV's first science fiction anthology. Of course, it's, the show straddled a lot of different genres and often several within the span of a single episode. And for this one that we kick off with, the first episode, Verdict from Space, uh, scripted by Theodore Sturgeon, we're kind of mixing science fiction with this, uh, as you can see, courtroom drama. And we're going to get to some Indiana Jones-style cave adventuring, too. <clears throat> and it's all wrapped in a doomsday scenario, so uh, we, we've got ourselves a, a, a big sandwich here. Uh, it's notable that producers would come right out of the gate with a doomsday story because uh, this is a program that we'll find has a, has a very dim view of humanity. And uh, pretty much every week there was some kind of dour warning about our inevitable doom. So this episode, Verdict from Space, was broadcast on ABC on August 3rd, 1951, uh, at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, as we mentioned. Although if you're on the West Coast, you had to wait until August 17th to see, see the kinescope of it. So the show starts off in the courtroom. The lawyer here, well, he just caught his lawyer playing tic-tac-toe. So you can see he's not really getting a very good shake. Uh, in the original story uh, that this is based on, uh, it was a coroner's inquest, actually, rather than a trial. But uh, it's still a, this fellow's accused of murder uh, that involves this strange-looking device we're seeing here. Lon McAllister is the one who plays this accused murderer. His character's name is Gordon Kent. McAllister was a former child actor. He made the rounds through uh, the TV anthologies like Suspense, Lux Video Theater, uh, Schlitz Playhouse, Ford Television Theater. You probably best remember him from Yankee Doodle Dandy. Uh, he did two episodes of Tales of Tomorrow, two other ones rather than uh, this one here. He did... Uh, one of the ones he did was the other Theodore Sturgeon story, actually, another one called Enemy Unknown. And he was, one, he was in one called The Last Man on Earth, alongside his same co-star from this episode, in fact, Martin Brands. So uh, we started off in the, in the courtroom intro there. We, uh, the story, uh, very similar to the original one by Theodore Sturgeon. It was originally titled The Sky Was Full of Ships, and it ran in the June 1947 issue of Thrilling Wonder Stories. That same story, actually, under its original name, was adapted in a, uh, for a summer 1978 weekly series of audio readings called Mind Webs. The Tales of Tomorrow version we're watching follows the format of the story fairly closely. It starts in the courtroom, and then it flashes back here. We see Kemp explaining how he was visited at his shop by this, uh, this sort of off-putting old man that uh, he's actually accused of killing. So Theodore Sturgeon, he'd already been involved in early TV anthologies like Out There, uh, he'd written a couple of episodes the previous year uh, for, for that series for various reasons, though, actually, due to his publishing contract. I think he did those under a pseudonym. Uh, despite being one of the first writers involved with the show, uh, Sturgeon only ended up being involved with a couple of other episodes. Uh, the aforementioned Enemy Unknown one was aired a few months after this, was based on one of his stories, although that was actually adapted by a different writer. And uh, in 1952, Sturgeon adapted a Stanley Gene Winebeam story, uh, and it was, I think that was the Miraculous Serum episode. Weinbaum, of course, uh, being one of the original 12 members of the Science Fiction League of America. Uh, you, you may actually remember Ted Sturgeon best from the 1974 TV movie Killdozer, which he scripted from his own novella. So here in our flashback, uh, the accused, who's an inventor, he made that strange device we saw. He's explaining how he was visited by this obsessed archaeology professor who claims to have discovered what he calls the key to the past, and it's in a cave somewhere. And the professor, he wants the young inventor to use that super torch we saw. That's a, an invention that he made uh, that's powered by atomic energy, uh, and he needs that to open the door to this strange cave, which the, the kid at first doesn't really want to do, uh, but the professor here is about to offer him 5,000 bucks, and uh, that's pretty well going to do it, and they're, they're going to be off cave hunting fairly soon. So, Martin Brandt, the uh, professor, Professor Adrian Sykes, his character name, uh, he's described in Sturgeon's original short story by the other character. And I'll read you that quote. <clears throat> it says, quote, A scrawny figure, probably 60 years old, and wound up real tight, unquote. Uh, and then a little later on in the story, it says, quote, He's queer as a $9 bill, unquote. Uh, and of course, uh, you can't hear the sound here because the engineer has it turned down, but uh, Brandt is of German and Polish descent uh, with a very flexible accent that uh, made him very versatile at doing a lot of different uh, TV anthologies. Uh, 
much like his co-star here, Lon McAllister. He was doing shows like Suspense. Uh, he did Lights Out. He did Hands of Mystery, Studio One, the Motorola Television Hour, Cameo Theater. Um, you know, and he actually turns up in a 1965 episode of a religious anthology called Insight, which is kind of a Christian Twilight Zone. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, it's very well worth looking up. It ran for years and years on Sunday mornings. And a lot of terrific actors turn up on that as well. He's probably best known, Martin Brandt, for playing the, uh, well, he plays Germans in war films like Judgment at Nuremberg. Um, you can see him on TV shows like 77 Sunset Strip, Man from Uncle. And in fact, if you look real close in the Outer Limits episode Nightmare from 1963, he has a real brief role, and I think uncredited role, as the grandfather of one of the characters in that. So the director of this episode, his name's Leonard Valenza, and uh, he also directed the second episode we'll talk about, Blunder. Uh, and then he pretty well bows out of the show. He was really just getting started on a career that would find him doing other TV anthologies like The Mask in 1954. He did Windows in 1955. He did The Big Story. Uh, the thing, you know, that, 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 I, I, that stuck out that... He did was nearly 300 episodes of a really strange 1953-1954 daily daytime sitcom called Marge and Jeff. Yes, you heard me right. So it was a syndicated daily sitcom, and it ran five days a week, and it was about newlyweds in Manhattan. And that thing ran for nearly two years, 300 episodes, and, and that was Leonard Valenta's baby. So... Here we got the, uh, the professor and the inventor. They've teamed up and they're on their way to this mysterious cave by way of a set that's really fairly typical of the series. Uh, it, it's fairly cheap and easy to dress a set like this. So there's countless episodes that are set on things like desert islands, uh, in jungles, and forests, in the wilderness. They're all pretty much geologically uh, the same. They, they all pretty much look like this here. And, uh, of course, here's a little product placement. This might be one of the first uh, instances of product placement in a TV show. That's a Chrysler watch that he's looking at. They're both actually, I think. No, his is the one that works. And uh, the guy in the background, his doesn't work because he wasn't smart enough to bring a Chrysler on this adventure. Chrysler watch man, Jacques Chrysler. They actually still make watches to this day. Uh, was one of the original program sponsors. And uh, it is by their grace that we got to see science fiction on television here in prime time because they fronted the money that, uh, that made all this happen. And back then, they didn't really uh, intrude that much in the, in the show. It was really just the beginning, the middle, and the end. That was their three shots uh, that they got. So here we've got, the, they're just reaching the cave door. And uh, I, I want to point out that this big metal door uh, kind of looks a little bit like the monolith from 2001. And, and that's worth noting, given what they find inside. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, like, like all good, good serialized stories, pretty soon here, they're going to leave this as a cliffhanger. And uh, we, we've got to uh, do a little commerce. This is what the, the sponsors are paying for, after all, there. Uh, and back then, you know, they, they, this was... Uh, uh, this was their main chance to, to get at you. We, we actually, in this one here, I think the, the commercial is cut out. Uh, they get right back to the cave door, and, uh, well, it turns out the professor, he, he confesses he's already been inside the cave. Uh, he spent years studying its contents, and it got sealed up, I think, in a landslide or, or an earthquake or something like that. And, and that's why he needs this guy who invented this super torch. And uh, Ted Sturgeon, in the short story this is uh, adapted from, he, he called in that story an atomic hydrogen torch. And... Uh, that's what he's using there. It uh, doesn't really look like a very impressive item. There's no real torch to be seen. It's uh, really just kind of a somewhat lazily outfitted ray gun. And uh, although the, the sound, you can't hear it unless you toggle over to the, the audio sound, it, it's just making kind of a fizzle. And uh, the sound actually left it running when he, when he was holding it. It was supposed to be turned off. But, you know, it's only the first episode, so they're still working out kinks like that. They get inside the cave, and this alien machinery you see here would actually turn up in other episodes. You'd uh, most, most notice it probably in the Frankenstein episode with Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, it's part of the lab that, uh, that, that, that Dr. Frankenstein builds. He, he's not an alien. In this case, we, what we've got here is alien technology, as we're finding out. The 
professor unspooling his story for us. They find this ancient looking machine and uh, the professor explains to them that what it's been doing in here is recording Earth's geological history. The, the old man explains that the machine is of interplanetary origin and it, it's somehow been monitoring the Earth. And every time something momentous registers geologically, like things like continental shifts, weather patterns, um, natural catastrophes like the explosion at Pompeii, uh, the San Francisco earthquake supposedly was recorded on this thing. Uh, and most notably here, the, it gets to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, is also somehow or other recorded. This guy has learned how to read this wire that records these things. And he, he deduces that each time one of these major events has happened, a message was then sent out, uh, presumably into outer space. And now, now you need to keep in mind, you know, they're talking about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs uh, having made an impression on this machine that is, is now something that the aliens know about. We're talking that only happened in August 1945, the atomic bomb drops, and that is really only six years previous to this episode airing on TV. And uh, this episode supposedly takes place, it, even though it's a 1951 episode, uh, in the beginning, they tell you that that courtroom scene takes place in 1952, so they're only projecting a year into the future, which is just a, you know, seven years after the atomic bombs were actually dropped. Uh, the Gordon Kent character, uh, right around this point, is saying something like, somewhere in this universe, someone has been watching us for millions of years, waiting, waiting until we have this secret information, when we could power an atomic-type torch. <clears throat> so... Yeah, the same kind of doohickey that uh, they used to burn the way into the cave. That's what the aliens were waiting for. So, well, the Gordon Kent character, uh, well, the alien wiry device that's been doing this, uh, the old professor, he's, he's had a lot of years to study it. Uh, he basically, you know, what, what we've got here, when the young guy finds out about it, it turns into this anti-nuke tale. He, he realizes that this is a great danger to them, and uh, instead of nuclear uh, you know, catastrophe causing giant grasshoppers and towering mutant housewives, the danger here isn't fanciful, but it's the real atomic arms race. That's what's, uh, you know, what could get them all killed. And the headlong rush to develop nuclear technology, much like the atomic power torch that this dummy just used to bring it into the cave here. So uh, the then recent atomic bomb blast made this machine go crazy. And as you can see, what, you know, we, we now got was going to be spun into a tale of murder. The poor, the poor guy is on trial in the present because he still had that 5,000 bucks that the professor gave him to do this thing with his atomic torch. The professor here, we can see, he got conked on the head with a falling rock, uh, and, and that's what killed him. But uh, our schmuck here is accused of killing him for cash. And Well, he actually has much bigger problems than just being accused of murder as he was trying to tell the judge back in the present. You know, the, the whole world is in danger because of, uh, you know, what they saw on this machine before someone rubbed a spatula of ketchup all over <laughs> the poor old man's face. So, you know, the alien wire device, the, you know, it, you have to think about the fact that it's kind of similar to uh, what Arthur C. Clarke did in 1951 in his story, The Sentinel, which eventually evolved into 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, only here we have the wire was uh, it was recording on this wire rather than this towering monolith, which again you know remember that cave door was kind of monolithic, uh, and uh, the aliens of course keeping a remote eye on mankind in 2001 have a much more benevolent intention than any aliens that we're going to meet in Tales of Tomorrow. <laughs> on this show, pretty much all alien races either hate us, they ignore us, or, or they just want to really screw around with us just just for the hell of it. And we're going to find out in a moment what, uh, what the case is here. So we're back to the courtroom now. And uh, although Tales of Tomorrow would feature a lot of past and future stars playing roles, from Paul Newman and James Dean to uh, Lee J. Cobb, Rod Steiger, Veronica Lake, uh, Verdict from Space gives us a kind of middle-of-the-road cast. The prosecuting attorney here is played by William Lally. He played a lot of bit roles on TV dramas like Dragnet and Highway Patrol, Ironside, Cannon. Uh, he also landed comedic roles in shows like My Three Sons and Petticoat Junction, That Girl, Hazel, uh, and The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. The actor, actors playing the defense attorney and the judge here, they don't have much to do. Uh, neither of them really have that many credits in Hollywood. The defense attorney is really, he's portrayed as such a hack here that we saw him scribbling you know, tic-tac-toe puzzles 
during the trial instead of speaking out for his client, which is weird because it takes two to play tic-tac-toe. So I guess maybe he and the professor were gaming it up during the testimony or uh, I don't know, maybe he and the accused. But Well, when we get to the cave scene, there's a brief shot of the accused tearing up the uh, tic-tac-toe sheet and annoyance there. So uh, maybe he's just mad at himself for losing there. Uh, it can be noticed that the actor who does play the judge, Bernard Lenrau, uh, he played Captain Nemo in the old RCA Victor Double 45 that adapted Disney's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And, and that was a story that would also be adapted for Tales of Tomorrow. People remember that record because it, it kind of ditched the whole Nemo Wants Revenge plot. And it, dis it basically disnified a Disney movie, made Captain Nemo out to be kind of little more than a, a nutty, adventure-loving underwater explorer who... Uh, I guess it just happens to like kidnapping people, so. Which actually isn't as weird as what Tales of Tomorrow does to it, but you're going to have to wait till we get to the commentary for that episode to find out, or at least the half of that uh, two-parter that still exists. So, I'll give you a spoiler alert here. I presume you've seen the show before you listen to the commentary, but uh, as we're about to find out, that signal that uh, the, the poor young doofus here tried to stop did get out. Uh, the aliens know we have the technology now, like that stupid nuclear blowtorch. And, uh, and they're going to arrive just in time to save the court from having to impose the death penalty by killing everyone on the planet. <laughs> so this guy actually, when you think about it, he is uh, guilty of murder. He, he murdered the whole human race by summoning the aliens with that, that stupid atomic blowtorch of his. Uh, the original uh, Theodore Sturgeon story ends with a single sentence quoting the title, the title being, The Sky Was Full of Ships, which, which kind of gives away the whole ending. So uh, probably a good thing they didn't use that for the Tales of Tomorrow version. Verdict from Space was certainly the, uh, the, the better TV title for this. So, well, now that the world has ended, they're going to finish off with some lovely watch bands manufactured by the Jacques Chrysler Company. <laughs> and, uh, they had several different shows on the air at the time. And uh, that about wraps it up for this episode of Tales of Tomorrow. If you uh, keep on playing this disc, we have another commentary for you on the uh, second episode, Blunder, uh, which actually the, the same creative team that worked on this debut episode worked on that. And uh, I hope you enjoyed viewing Verdict from Space and listening to us talk about it as much as we enjoyed talking about it with you.